Nope. There we go. Forgot the thing over the screen. Looks like we are rolling here. Uh, hello, this program. <laughs> little, this techno stuff is driving me nuts. This is class number 11. I got too much to learn. I can't believe all the things they changed. Nine years in prison. They brought the outhouse into the building. I got the little lever thing figured out. Anyway, so we're slowly, slowly going to get up, caught up to speed, I hope. Maybe not. I'll just hire a secretary. Uh, we're talking about, uh, in my book, What on Earth is About to Happen, which hopefully is going to be available in the next 30 days or so as a hardback thank you for those who donate money to help the ministry get started. If you want to help on that, you can get on the list with uh, uh, Theodore at uh, freekenthovend.com or with Ernie Land at docfog at docfog.com. Ernie if also has a, a business with uh, rxsmartcoffee.com if you want to get involved in making people's babies be born naked from drinking coffee that's a wonderful way to go and he would uh, he's a great been a great friend for 26 years now so god bless ernie and i would trust him with anything he's, um, and i do i trust him with a lot of stuff okay so we're talking about appendix number five which we have the day of the lord which is this thousand year period here on the big chart and then this is greatly expanded here we took out 416 feet because it would be really long if we kept it the same scale but this day of the Lord has two distinct parts. It has the time of wrath being poured out and then the time of great blessing, which is by far the longest part. While this is happening on earth, we have been raptured up, if you're Christian, that is, to heaven. And several things are going on up there. There's the marriage feast. But before that, we have the judgment seat of Christ. When everybody's going to be tested, their rewards are going to be determined based upon whether you did things for the right reason or not. This is not to determine if you're going to heaven. That's already been decided. You're going. Jesus paid it all. This is to determine the rewards you get. Wood, hay, stubble, which will burn, or gold, silver, precious stones, which will not burn. At the marriage supper of the Lamb, uh, which apparently lasts for 1,040 days, and I get that number simply from 2,300 days of desolation minus 1,260 days of tribulation. So 12, 1,040, or a little less than three years, <clears throat> is the time of God's wrath. Now, the two comings of Christ, he comes once to the clouds and back up. He never touches down. Later, he comes down all the way to the earth and touches down at the Mount of Olives for the Battle of Armageddon. What I want to talk about now is the difference between these two comings. And in my book on page 192, until it gets edited, there's a chart showing the differences between the two comings of Christ. Let's see, backwards here. I'm going to try to explain a little bit of that here. The first time he comes, he comes to get his bride. The second time, he comes with his bride all the way down. First time, he comes only to the clouds. Second time, he comes all the way to the Mount of Olives. First time, believers are judged. Second time, Israel and the unbelievers are judged. First time he comes, it affects only the believers. Second time he comes back, three years later, about three years, it affects the whole world. First time he comes, he splits the sky. Second time he comes, he splits the Mount of Olives. The Bible says the Mount of Olives, which is right east of Jerusalem, just a quarter mile, it's not far, and about 100 feet higher than the, than the temple, that mountain will split east to west, and the mountain will actually move north and south, opening up a valley, probably over to the Dead Sea. Get a map of, uh, and when I do this in PowerPoint, and I appreciate you folks being the guinea pig so I can practice, I just, just got out of prison after nine years, but uh, I will get this together in PowerPoint, put together a really cool PowerPoint presentation someday when my brother straightens up. He's a hunchback, so that may be a while. I'm just kidding, Hannah. Uh, I'll explain it later. Anyway, uh, so when it's in PowerPoint, I'll have the maps and all this stuff showing the valley. But for now, look up your own, okay? From Jerusalem straight over to the Dead Sea, it's about 15 miles. If that opens up a new valley and then a fountain comes out from under the temple and pours water through there, I suspect my theory would be that will wash out the eastern gate and wash out that cemetery, and Messiah will come through, and it'll be water up to the ankles. Uh, Ezekiel talks about that vision of the water to the ankles for 1,500 cubits, uh, which is about, what, half a mile. And then 1,500 cubits where the water's up to the knees. Uh, so I think there's, it's probably going to fill in that entire valley. But the uh, first time he comes, <clears throat> it's a message of comfort. Second time he comes, second time he comes, it's a uh, message of judgment. First time he comes, he delivers the believers from the wrath to come. And he is we're going to be delivered from the wrath to come. We're not here for the wrath of God. We are here for the tribulation. Second time he comes, three years later, he brings the final wrath at Armageddon. This battle of Armageddon, named after the Valley of Megiddo, you get a map of Israel, you go to the north, 
side on the near the Mediterranean Sea, you'll see the uh, city of Megiddo, M-E-G-G-D-O, M-E-G-G-E-D-O, and that valley there is about roughly tri triangular, about 35 miles in uh, 35 by 35, huge, huge, just a big flat plain, the valley of Megiddo. Napoleon came through there and said all the armies of the world could fight in this valley. And technically he's right. I mean, people don't realize the population of the world today at 7 billion would all fit inside the city limits of Jacksonville, Florida. Do the math. Jacksonville, Florida has 25 billion square feet. There are 7 billion people in the world. That gives everybody about 3.5 square feet, like you're standing in an elevator. The whole world, everybody, would fit in Jacksonville, Florida. So either that city is pretty big or there aren't very many people here compared to what we think. So the world is not overcrowded. Drive across Kansas sometime. You'll see what I'm talking about. And tell Al Gore, if it's overcrowded where you are, move. Okay, uh, so he delivers from uh, the wrath in the first coming, and he, delivers, he brings the final wrath at Armageddon. That's when God's going to pour out his wrath on the planet for those that are left. The first time he comes, it's a day to rejoice. The second time, it's a day for the lost people to fear. The day of the Lord's vengeance is come. First time he comes from earth to heaven. Next time he comes from heaven to earth. We go from earth to heaven. Uh, we go up to heaven, and then the second time, we come from heaven down to earth. The lastly, he comes with a trumpet the first time. Second time, he comes with a sword. Those are some of the differences between these two comings of the Lord, called the first and second advent, all of it having to do with the, his really his second coming. He came once 2,000 years ago, and now his second coming has these two parts, and most people call it the second advent instead. And we come with white horses, uh, uh, the whole the bride of Christ, which is, I don't understand all that, but all the believers become part of the bride, singular, of Christ. Whether each get to be part of the body, depending upon your faithfulness, uh, somebody's going to be the toenail and somebody else might be the ear. Who knows? We'll see how that works out. I can already think of a few spots that a few people can be. I'll let you work that out yourself. So he touches down on the Mount of Olives. The Mount of Olives splits in half. That's in Zechariah chapter 14. It says, his feet shall stand in that day upon the Mount of Olives, which is before Jerusalem on the east. And the Mount of Olives shall cleave in the midst thereof toward the east and toward the west. And there shall be a very great valley. And the half of the mountain shall move toward the north and half of it toward the south. I cannot explain how that will happen, but it says it will happen. That would be a great valley, I think, we just suspect, will go all the way over to the Dead Sea. And the Dead Sea will come to life when the fresh water pours into it. I've been swimming in the Dead Sea. It is extremely salty, one of the saltiest, if not the saltiest, body on earth. You get in there, and if you have a, a scratch any place on your body, you will find it right away, and you'll remember it for three days, as it'll hurt from that salt in there. If you, I got a drop in my mouth. They said, don't get any in your mouth. Well, I got one drop, and I tasted it for the next three days. It was awful. I have a bottle of Dead Sea water in the museum. Just a bottle of water compared to a regular bottle of water. People pick them up and it's like, gee whiz, it's just a lot heavier. I don't remember how much, like 20% heavier from the high salt concentration. You can go lay down in there and you float extremely high because the water is so dense. Very similar to Salt Lake, but maybe somebody can tell me. I think it is saltier than Salt Lake. <clears throat> and by the way, the Dead Sea committed suicide. A lot of people don't know that. Why is it the Dead Sea? Well, it killed itself. Always taking in, never giving out. Good way to kill yourself, too. Make sure, make life all about you and never give out. Good way to commit suicide. Okay, so I have a whole section in my book about this battle of Armageddon, if you want to read that. Uh, <clears throat> some of the things that are going to happen, there's a lot in Zechariah chapter 14, which is near the end of the Old Testament, about this final battle called the Battle of Armageddon. It takes place in the Valley of Megiddo. There's also uh, a lot in Revelation chapter 19 about this battle. You can read those passages for yourself when the, the fighting is all done. There's a map right here in my book of northern Israel with the valley of Megiddo, let's see, right there, where this battle will take place. This is about, I'm guessing, 60 miles from where Jesus touches down on the Mount of Olives, maybe 80 miles. So it looks like this time of Jesus coming back and fighting is going to take uh, uh, some days, I would think, maybe even a few weeks, I don't know. But then Satan is cast into the pit. Now, this is not hell. It says he's cast into the pit. Get your Bibles and turn to Revelation chapter 20. Revelation chapter 20 talks about this time when it's just about over. Revelation 20, verse 1. And I saw an angel come down from heaven, 
having the key <clears throat> of the bottomless pit and a great chain in his hand. And he laid hold on the dragon, that old serpent, which is the devil and Satan. Well, here we have evidence that all four of these names are applied to the same guy. And bound him a thousand years and cast him into the bottomless pit. I don't know how that's possible other than, of course, if you assume you drill a hole through the earth and drop something in, it'll fall to the middle and keep going to the other edge and keep bouncing back and forth because the center of gravity would be the earth, the center of the mass. But as you get down, you would weigh less, actually because now you're being attracted up as well as down, since gravity is the attraction of masses. So there's a really, in theory, a, a big hole through the earth. You drop something in, it would just bounce back and forth. It would be a constantly falling, a bottomless pit. That is one possible answer. I don't know. It says it's a bottomless pit, and I believe it. Okay. And cast him into the bottomless pit and shut him up and set a seal upon him, that he should deceive the nations no more, till the thousand years should be fulfilled. After that, he must be loosed a little season. And I saw thrones, and they sat upon them, and judgment was given unto them. And I saw the souls of them that were beheaded for the witness of Jesus. So the method of execution during this time of tribulation, and maybe even during this time of wrath, for those who don't go along with the mark of the beast, the method of execution for the non-cooperative folks like me is going to be beheading. That's what it says. Now what on earth, what nation, what tribe, what, what religion uses beheading as a means of execution. The Romans use crucifixion. The Jews use stoning. Ah, I have to do some research on that. Let's see. They're beheaded for the witness of Jesus and for the word of God, which had not worshipped the beast, neither his image. So even though Antichrist makes it a rule, you have to receive the mark, obviously some are not going to receive the mark. And by the way, there are some times where laws are passed or rules are made that you do not obey them. That's been the history of humanity. You don't have to obey every law if, it's, if it violates God's law. Don't receive the mark. It says uh, they, they did not receive the mark, and so they lived and reigned with Christ a thousand years. <clears throat> Revelation 20, verse 5. <clears throat> but the rest of the dead lived not again until the thousand years were finished. This is the first resurrection. Now, there is great controversy on this topic, and I don't think I've got it all figured out myself. But it appears... Jesus comes down, Battle of Armageddon, this thousand years, those who have been martyred for Christ for over the centuries, they are resurrected, get their body back, and they get to rule and reign with Christ for a thousand years. What about the unfaithful Christians? Well, they still get to go to heaven. They're saved. As best I can figure out, they're up in heaven wishing they could have been down on earth. So they forfeited that thousand-year kingdom. Uh, difference between the kingdom of heaven and the kingdom of God, apparently. So I don't have that all figured out. But the thousand years is the bonus prize for those who are faithful, those who are killed. Hey, you gave up your life for me. I'm going to give you an extra thousand years of life on earth. That's a pretty good paycheck. So verse, certainly those who are martyred get this prize. Now, do other people get it? I don't know. I think so. Those who were willing to be martyred, but martyrdom wasn't happening at that time. You know, during their lifetime, it was... People weren't getting killed, so what, they were willing to, but nobody nobody offered to kill them. I'm sure there's some would love to kill me out there. Woo! Okay, Revelation 20, verse 6. Blessed and holy is he that hath part in the first resurrection. On such the second death hath no power. But they shall be priests of God and of Christ, and shall reign with him a thousand years. So it's clear the martyrs get to rule and reign. It is not clear whether anybody else gets to come also. I think so, but we shall have to see. Verse 7, and when the thousand years are expired, Satan shall be loosed out of his prison. Now, he's not in hell. He's in the pit. Verse 8, and shall go out to deceive the nations which are in the four quarters of the earth, Gog and Magog, which is in Turkey, to gather them together to battle, to the number of whom is as the sand of the sea. So at the end of this thousand years, Satan is going to be released, and he's still able to deceive people, and they're numbered like the sand of the sea. Millions, billions. He's going to be able to raise up another army to rebel against God again. I think this is to demonstrate two things. The people living under the rule of Jesus Christ on earth are still going to be rebellious. And so when they are cast into the lake of fire, everybody on earth is going to see, God, you are perfectly just to do what you're doing. And the devil... After he's had a thousand years in this pit, he still hasn't learned a thing. 
And people are going to say, God, you're perfectly just. This guy deserves to go to hell forever. We're all going to see that God is righteous for doing what he does. Nobody's going to say, oh, poor devil, if he only would have had another chance. Okay, God's going to give him another chance. After a thousand years of being chained in the pit, he's released and he still doesn't get it. Revelation chapter 20, verse 9. And they went up on the breadth of the earth and compassed the camp of the saints about and the beloved city, and fire came down from God out of heaven and devoured them. Apparently, this battle of Armageddon is going to take a place and going to be a river of blood 200 miles long uh, and up to the horse's bridle, it says. I did the math on that, how much uh, blood a person has and how many people would have to die, and that's all in the book here. A 200-mile long river, I think it'd be like 30 feet wide if it was V-shaped and up to the horse's bridle in the middle, which we calculated to be four and a half feet or something like that when we did this. So that to, uh, the people in this battle could easily supply enough blood to fill a valley 200 miles long, a, a V-shaped valley, uh, I think 40 feet wide and 4 feet deep or 4 and a half feet deep in the middle. Um, and some skeptic will spend the rest of his life trying to debunk my math on that instead of getting the point. Okay, it's going to be a lot of blood. People are going to die. Okay, verse number 10. And the devil that deceived them was cast into the lake of fire. Now, if he was in the pit, now we're going to go before the great white throne judgment, and then you're going to go to either heaven, if you're saved, eternal heaven, or to the lake of fire. Lake of fire is not the same as hell. Hell is the temporary place designed to hold people until this judgment, and then they're cast into the lake of fire, which is a different place. And the lake of fire is mentioned in Matthew 13, 40 to 42, Matthew 7, verse 2, Matthew 25, verse 41, Mark uh, 9, verse 42, Revelation chapter 20. I've got all little notes on here about where you can read more about that. If you want to read more about the eternal heaven, you can see Revelation 21, all the way through the end of Revelation 22. The next two chapters talk about what God has planned for this in heaven. Um, right now, it appears that if a person dies, they go straight to heaven, but not they don't have a body. That's the best I can figure out. And they're wanting to be clothed upon. Hey, Lord, I, need a, I would like a body. They're just a spirit. Uh, and my theology is not all straight on that, and I'm sure I'll get 400 emails uh, <laughs> telling me what, what to believe. I'll, I'll read them, and I work on that. I'm willing to listen. Okay, Revelation chapter 20, verse 11. And I saw a great white throne, and him that sat on it, from whose face the earth and the heaven were fled away, and there was found no place for them. And I saw the dead, small and great, stand before God, and the books were opened, and another book was opened, which is the book of life. And the dead were judged out of those things which were written in the books, according to their works. If God's got ten angels just keeping track of you, writing down everything you think, everything you say, and everything you do, and Judgment Day, those angels are called up to testify, and they read everything in those books. What would happen to you at this great white throne judgment if everything you ever said, everything you ever thought, and everything you ever did was read out loud? for the whole world to see, in court, with God himself as the judge. If that thought makes you nervous, and it should, let me tell you what you can do about it. The blood of Jesus Christ, God's Son, cleanseth us from all sin. Forty-six and a half years ago, I prayed, said, Lord, I'm a sinner. And all the angels said, yeah, you can say that again. But Lord, I believe you died for me and rose from the dead. I want to receive your payment on my account. And I got my sins forgiven. So they're going to open my book, Judgment Day, Great White Throne, Kent Hovind, nothing here, Lord, send him in. Yep, come on in, Kent. The people that know me are going to say, what do you mean? I knew him. He had sin in his life. Yep, paid for. <laughs> okay, Revelation 20, verse 13. And the sea gave up the dead which were in it, and death and hell delivered up the dead which were in them, and they were judged every man according to their works. And death and hell were cast into the lake of fire. This is the second death. And whosoever was not found written in the book of life was cast into the lake of fire. That is what happens in appendix number five of the book, dealing with this thousand-year period, which we broke up into five parts, five A, B, C, D, and E. Five A is the sealing of the 144,000 Jews. 5B is the three years of wrath being poured out. 5C is the battle of Armageddon, the return of Christ on white horses, us with him, if you're saved. And then 5D is the thousand-year period of everything wonderful with Satan bound in the pit. 
there apparently are going to be both uh, mortal and immortal people on the planet. That's the only way I can make it fit. Those who've been faithful, the martyrs, they will get to rule and reign with Christ for that thousand years. Rule over who? We'll rule over the heathen that live through the time of wrath. And there's going to be a bunch of them, maybe a couple of billion. We'll have to wait and see. And they'll be having kids and grandkids and great-grandkids. And it might be that things will be restored to Garden of Eden conditions when people used to live to be nearly a thousand before the flood, according to Genesis chapter uh, uh, 5. It could be that the conditions will be restored and we'll get to see what Adam and Eve saw. Maybe a canopy up above. And I'm a strong believer that there was a canopy of ice or water above the atmosphere. Uh, that answers a lot of problems. It certainly seems to fit the scripture. And we cover that in our uh, regular seminar series, uh, seminar part two about the Garden of Eden. What was it like? Now, the question is, where are you going? What are you going to do? You're not going to be able to say, oh, well, you know, Grandma was a Christian, therefore I get to go in. No, no, no. It doesn't matter what Grandma did. It doesn't matter what Grandpa did. What, is, what about you? See, God does not have any grandchildren. You're either a child of God or you're not. It's not hereditary. Everybody has to be, accept Jesus Christ as their personal Savior. And if you've never done that, why don't you do it right now? What on earth are you waiting for? Jesus did it all. He came, lived a perfect life, the absolute sinless Lamb of God was killed a horrible death on the cross so that we can be forgiven. His blood's available. He's standing there holding out the check. Would you like me to pay your bills for you? And all you got to do is say yes. It's real simple. There is no magic prayer. But 46 and a half years ago, I prayed something like this. I said, Lord, I am a sinner. I deserve to go to hell. But I believe you died for me. I believe you rose from the dead, and I'd like to ask you to forgive me and come live in my heart. Amen. That was, like I said, no magic prayer, but that's what I prayed and said, Lord, would you please save me? How about you? If you did, if you asked the Lord to save you, write this date down and say, today is my birthday into God's family. Get yourself a calendar, and on August the 11th, write down spiritual birthday. Because you have to be born again to go to heaven. John chapter 3 talks about that. And how do you get born again? Well, John chapter 1 already said, if you receive him, you become a child of God. John chapter 1, verse 12. That's how you get, become a child of God, by receiving him. The seed gets planted and it begins to grow. I'm like the dirt. He's like the seed. All I did was invite him in and it's him growing in me. Now, if you are saved, what does he want you to do? Well, like every parent wants their child to do, they want him to grow at some point, they want them to get out of the house and go start their own family and reproduce so they can have some grandkids like me and my five. It's wonderful. When you get sick of them, say, go home. <laughs> go clean up your own mess. Grandkids are God's reward for not killing your own kids. It is amazing. And mine live next door. Praise God for that. Just saw them a few minutes ago. So if you are saved and you've been saved for a while, God wants you to bring forth some fruit. Go make more babies in the spiritual world. Get somebody saved. Go tell somebody else about it. If you can't get a big one, get a little one. But somebody will listen to you. And if you've never led a soul to Christ, you are missing the greatest joy in the spiritual life. Reading your Bible is wonderful, and I do, and I recommend it, and I know it fairly well, and I've read it for 46 years, read it many, many times. That's wonderful. But to get a head full of this and not tell anybody about it is like the Dead Sea. You're going to commit suicide. You're taken in, taken in, and you're going to be toxic. Give it out. A healthy lake takes in and gives out, and the lake stays healthy. The Dead Sea committed suicide. A lot of Christians are doing the same thing. Go to church, listen, pray, watch t spiritual programs on TV, read their Bible, and never give it away to anybody. That is not the way it's supposed to be. So if you're saved, go tell somebody. I don't know when this is coming, folks, but we got some real bad times coming, and I would recommend every Christian quit worrying about who wins the stupid bowl and go find somebody to win to Christ. We're headed for a disaster on this planet, and it's coming like a freight train, and it's probably man-made, most of it, okay? And they probably think they're pinky in the brain, going to rule the world, and they got all their plans, I know. God's laughing at their plan, Psalm chapter 2. But meanwhile, it's going to get pretty bad. So if you have never accepted Jesus Christ, why not? Why don't you do it right now? After this thousand years, we go to either heaven or hell. That's the choice. 
and you're going to be there an extremely long time. You might want to pack for that trip. Be really sure you've been forgiven and are going to heaven. If you are, and find somebody else you can win to Christ. Everybody can win somebody. There's people you can reach that I cannot reach. There are people, believe it or not, who will not listen to me. They will listen to you. You can reach some that I can't, and I think everybody ought to just do their job. Now, in light of the fact that we got these horrible bad times coming, and it's coming, what should we do about it? What should we do now to prepare? Well, Appendix 7 of the book deals with, okay, in light of all this, what should we do? And I have, let's see, starting on page 218 all the way to 243, I have, uh, what, 25 pages of ideas of things you ought to do. We won't take time now to cover that. You can get the book. If you want to help out, get hold of Ernie, Doc Fogg at docfog.com, D-O-C-F-O-G, at docfog.com. He'll be glad to uh, help you. If you want to support the ministry, that would be great. Uh, so we are done. I'm going to get back to questions. Hannah, I'm so sorry. I have, uh, and this is, I don't know, uh, this is just, I haven't even looked the last three days. Uh, we got, we'll get to a bunch of questions. Thank you so much for your patience. Hope this helps.